Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mutual Knowledge. I am Gauthier Lamotte, your host, and today my guest is Marina Markežić from the European Blockchain Initiative. Hi, Marina. Hi, hello. Nice to um, talk to you, and thank you so much for this invite. Thank you for you. Thanks to you for being here. And so, first of all, Marina, how did you come in contact with the blockchain industry? How did you end up where you are at the moment? Yes, I love this question. So basically, in 2016, I was working at a crowdfunding at a crowdfunding platform. Mm -hmm. And at the time, some project came to us wanted to do crowdfunding mm -hmm. uh, or crowd investing, as we call it at the time, because it was a little bit more linked to, to loans. And they had this idea to do a stablecoin, basically. And that's how I uh, came across blockchain. So I had to learn about blockchain, stable coins, and other crypto assets all in one um, hour at the meeting. But of course, I didn't manage to do that. So we had multiple meetings and then at the end, uh, in a way, understood that that crowd investing platform was not the best one. It was a, a really like a platform where, you know, basic SMEs would go to, I don't know, they have an idea for uh, a new drink and they would promote it on that platform and this is how it was basically um, shared with with the with the audience the audience would uh, would support it but that was a completely different thing and very very complicated stuff so uh, this is how how I started and I joined an accelerator mostly working on the legal stuff uh, as well of business development and helping projects uh, with investments and after that I was working as an advisor to many projects right now I'm leading the European crypto initiative and I'm also the co-founder so this work has been very very interesting since um, in a way being uh, a jurist a lawyer at the beginning uh, in this area uh, there was a lot of questions from regulators what is an investment coin offering initial coin offering what is the crypto asset, etc. So we've been always in touch with them. Uh, but then lately in 2022, the first draft of uh, Mika was published. And that means that that was also something that was very interesting for us. Um, sorry, in 2020 uh, was the first draft of Mika published. And that also means that in a way, the discussion uh, went on a higher level on the European Union level. And this is where we are today. All right. So uh, for our listeners who are interested in the blockchain tech as payment solutions, there are many questions about how we can, you know, make basically the big spaces communicate with each other. So, for example, well, let's put aside China and Russia, which are a bit particular, but uh, let's say uh, uh, the US and Canada, South America, Africa, European Union and uh, Asia outside of China. Um so you're trained in law. Can you explain to those who are not from the European Union what Mika is? M I C. -A. Oh yes, absolutely. I'm happy to do that. So Mika stands for the Markets in Crypto Assets Regulation, which is basically a regulation uh, that, in a way, was first drafted by the European Commission. Then it went through the whole legislative process with the Parliament being involved, the Council as well, that represents different member states. And then through the process of trialogue, we came up with a final version of this regulation. Uh, it was published in the official journal of the European Union in June last year, so June 2023. And the first part will be applicable in a year. So June 2024 uh, will have the part that regulates stable coins or e-money tokens or asset reference tokens, as Mika calls them. And the second part, the part when it comes to token issuance and when it comes to crypto as a service providers will be applicable by the end of this year. So it's pretty important uh, that the name and the part of um, that, that basically says regulation, just because it is directly applicable in all the member states which in a way means that uh, there's not going to be differences between member states and how it is implemented, but it's going to be uniquely implemented in all member states, which in a way brings a very positive thing. Um, it brings a unified market when it comes to crypto assets. So whoever would like to issue a crypto asset 
whoever would like to basically operate a crypto as a service provider and offer the uh, services to the European Union users, they will be able to do it in the same way by going to one national competent authority like the EMF for sure, uh, for example, or Buffin or Consop. And basically, those uh, the, the licenses will be passported all over Europe, and that means that they can operate in all the European countries. Okay, so basically now there's a framework, so you don't have to worry whether uh, about whether your um, your cryptocurrency or the blockchain projects you're using will be legal or illegal. You just know exactly the framework in order to be legal or illegal in uh, in the European Union, right? Yeah, so this was actually the goal, the main one of the main goals of Mika was to basically promote consumer protection, which means that the regulator was looking into what are the risks that are out there, what are the uh, things that are happening, the innovation in the space, and what poses such a risk that it needs to be regulated. And in this case, we have a lot of rules when it comes to issuance of crypto assets. So in this way, the regulator was thinking, okay, if we write this through, rules if we have a very uh, in a way set process it just means that you will be safer as a user if you would want to uh, buy some of those crypto assets there is a white paper that the issuers needs to write when it comes to the issuance and there is a notification obligation for all the issuers and in this case in a way um, there is a control there's enough information shared by with the users with the buyers of what this crypto asset does, etc. An interesting part is also that they um, require information about the energy consumption of the crypto asset. And uh, of course, the other part of Mika is focusing on the crypto asset service providers. So usually we buy crypto assets on exchanges and those exchanges are going to be pretty heavily regulated. And now with Mika and again, uh, unified all over Europe. So you as a European user, yes, would feel safer right now with this uh, rules being in place and, of course, also implemented by those crypto as a service providers. Okay, let me play the devil's advocate here. Uh, what mm -hmm. do you think of the stance of people saying that Mika is basically uh, hindering the market because, you know, First of all, the, um, it centralizes the way um, the blockchain industry can be uh, used to fuel businesses, first of all. And second, it changes the way businesses can be conducted compared to, for, uh, to say, the US or Asia uh, and can you know, uh, discourage some entities to incorporate in, uh, in the EU, just as some other entities decided not to incorporate in the U.S. for a crypto business because it could be problematic in order to issue an ICO. What do you think about that stance? Not saying that this stance is true or that I necessarily believe in it, but I'd like to have your expert advice on that. Of course, and I'm happy to respond to this question, and I'm also glad you asked. So unfortunately, to a certain extent, this is true. The crypto asset space and, of course, the blockchain space is so novel and so revolutionary that just, you know, adding regulation to it, it means something that will have a big impact on the whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, first, it means that small and medium enterprises, the ones that will not have the capacity to be compliant, will most likely be in trouble. Mm -hmm. which means that they might need additional uh, funding to basically secure potential licenses or compliance, or they would be most likely maybe bought or they will merge with some other organizations uh, and companies. Mm -hmm. The bigger ones will be uh, having even more compliance hurdles. So again, hiring new people, educating, etc., changing the whole processes. The whole process of getting a license, if you are a crypto asset service provider, takes a lot of time. Um, they were estimating a year, maybe a year and a half, and it's a really long process. So, of course, it's not easy. Uh, at the same time, what uh, also as EUCI, as an advocacy group, we were negotiating during the process was that the decentralized use cases, uh, DAOs, etc., would be excluded from Mika, just because we do not have clarity enough yet at the moment to understand how to regulate them. And of course, um, they are so different from anything that we have known before. So that was luckily included uh, in the regulation. 
So the fact that the decentralized, fully decentralized organizations and entities are excluded from the scope of Mika. We yet need to understand what, uh, in a way, this means, what it means to be decentralized. We do not have clarity from legislators, yes, on this topic, but we will have it, I hope, uh, during the next months uh, from different national competent authorities or maybe even from some of the regulatory technical standards issued by the European Securities Market Authority or the European Banking Authority, but most likely not. Most likely it will be a case-by-case, case, uh, in a way, assessment by the national competent authorities. So this is one part. The other very interesting part is also the non-fungible tokens. The non-fungible tokens are included in Mika, although they were not there in the first draft. And right now we have a definition that says that basically non-fungible token are excluded from the scope of Mika, but of course they need to be unique. And what uniqueness means, uh, it's also something that we still need to understand. So we don't know where exactly this, uh, in a way, limit is, what is still a crypto asset and thus fungible and what is a non-fungible token and non-fungible enough for it not to be traded um, and having maybe the same price, having a market on a secondary uh, secondary market, etc. But fascinating, <laughs> and it's interesting what you're saying about licenses because indeed, uh, in any industry, if I am a huge heavy hitter, I can dis definitely, uh, you know, advocate and, and say advocate taxes and say oh we need to have higher taxes and higher higher standards for licenses uh, because yes if i have the money to pay for these licenses my small competitors will not so that's not really a tax that's an investment from this perspective um and you said something about uh, about DAOs. It, 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 do you think we could have something as what we're having in a few U.S. states. Uh, for example, in the U.S., there are some states where a DAO can be sued if there are complaints or there's a class action lawsuit. Uh, do you think something like that could happen in the EU as well for DAOs? Uh, yes. So I am very careful when I'm using the word DAOs mm -hmm. and so decentralized autonomous organizations for everyone that is listening. And I think that, um, you know, some forms are saying that they are DAOs, but I wouldn't say that they are in this very strict sense of what a decentralized organization is. And there's also so many questions around, can DAOs be incorporated? Can just a part of a DAO be incorporated, etc.? So I think there needs to be more clarity when it comes to taxonomy of DAOs for sure. But um, we do have something that was included in the European Commission's uh, metaverse strategy. And in this strategy, we do have a very short description, few paragraphs on DAOs, and that that would be something interesting for the Commission to explore, especially in maybe a direction that would um, look more like a digital form of a cooperative, something similar. And there needs to be more research done in this case. So we do anticipate that there is going to be research done uh, within the Commission, of course, most likely with external researchers, and that after that first step is done, we'll see, you know, what will come up from the research and most likely in the future, maybe something like a potential framework for, for DAOs. Uh, but again, uh, going back to was it really and will it really be something for DAOs and what kind of use cases can we then in a way incorporate in this manners? Fascinating. Which leads us then to an obvious question. What are you guys doing at the European Blockchain Initiative? Okay, thank you so much for the question. So we're doing, at the European uh, Crypto Initiative, we do exist for the last, let's say, three and a half years. And since then, we have mostly in the first years negotiated Mika. We were talking to the European Commission, the European Parliament, and of course the council on different parts of Mika that the industry was not very happy about or we wanted changes or just some tweaks in wording etc we also conducted a lot of events and workshops within uh, and with the regulators uh, but other topics that are also very interesting and important for the crypto scene came up 
since then. So we have a whole package on the anti-money laundering part where uh, a lot of discussion around definition of self-hosted wallets and limitation of use of self-hosted wallets was discussed. There is also a specific regulation that is very uh, targeted to uh, financial instruments or securities on the blockchain, the DLT pilot regime, which is a pilot regime like a sort of a sandbox. So we'll see how it will evolve in the last next few years. But it's also an interesting, um, I would say it's pretty an interesting, interesting uh, piece of regulation. And then recently we had a lot of um, regulations that are also linked to payments. So that might be interesting for you and for your for your audience, because the payment services directive, the third uh, version has been discussed right now, and um, also the regulations. So it's pretty important, especially because some of the crypto assets might be included in this directive. Um, and it is important to for us to understand how and in which case that would be uh, a reality and how can even those crypto assets issuers then comply with this or even uh, some kind of a payment service providers can comply with it just because of the difference as we know within the um, usage of a permissionless open blockchain versus a permissioned one um, and the permissionless one is pretty complicated when it comes to some of the requirements of the payments uh, regulation. May I again um, respectfully play the devil's advocate regarding the, the uh, possible regulations? Um, what do you think of the stance that basically says, okay, cryptocurrencies can be used for money laundering, uh, but basically, if you know all the cryptocurrencies in the world would be uh, were were taken for shady activities, illegal ones, and let's say consensually illegal ones. I'm not talking about poor people buying their illegal medications to survive in Venezuela. I'm talking about terrorism and uh, and uh, human trafficking or, uh, you know, j just the hardcore stuff. Even if, if um, all the cryptocurrencies were, uh, were used to... Um, Uh, to basically indulge in these activities uh, that would represent something like one per, uh, less than one percent of the whole traffic because the the main currency is usually the the dollar and uh, after that the euro for terrorism for example um, what do you think of the stance that stay is that, that says that states are not really competent in order to regulate money laundering since um, most states all also fund uh, illegal activities themselves. So um, uh, what do you think about the fact that uh, of, of that uh, that stands saying that these regulations are not really here in order to protect people from money laundering, which is a, an actually trivial thing, but more from real other issues like pri basically it's protecting pr people from privacy and protecting people from freedom and yes i know i'm using the term protecting in a very cynical way what do you think of that stance do you think that's an ethical concern um that that should raise debate and uh, you know in um, among the actors of the blockchain industry or do you think that debate is already over and that most people have moved on to something else and that this This debate will not happen anymore because now people are just thinking fi uh, in terms of finance. I think that this debate should really happen uh, more often, maybe, and should always be present, no matter what the legislative process uh, is at the moment, even if the anti-money laundering package and the regulation directive and also the transfer funds regulation have been finalized. I think it's very, very important for us to be aware of the privacy perspective mm. of whatever regulation comes up. Uh, by the way, we have just learned last week that uh, the new AML authority is going to have a seat in Frankfurt. This is very important for all the European listeners because we had a competition with uh, many different states on who will uh, who will basically win the seat. Mm. So that's now uh, discussed because uh, the European Union is now also 
uh, in a way, establishing a new authority is the anti-money laundering authority. So in a way, also centralizing more uh, the overview when it comes to anti-money laundering. And I think that overall, different countries around the world, they have different um, systems of how they fight anti-money laundering. And there's different... Um, I would say trust in those countries and those governments. And of course, I cannot simplify, but I think that especially in the case when it comes to crypto assets, we need to be even more, um, I would say, aware of the privacy concerns just because of all the information that are public on the public blockchain. Of course, like a lot of us are somehow pseudonymously present there with the wallets that we hold and not anonymous because that's in a way not possible. But at the same time, combining and keeping in mind that there's so much information out there that is public, combining this with a huge information database that a lot of companies might have and will have with the new uh, rules when it comes to anti-money laundering fighting, I think we need to be much, much more aware of the basically the seriousness of this situation, uh, potential uh, preventing or potential, I don't know, cyber attacks uh, on those data, uh, data honeypots, uh, I would say, and any kind of leakage. And I think at the same time, we need to use the information that we can have and get from the blockchain, uh, blockchain itself as much as possible. And I think that some part of digitalization and automation can happen there as well in order not to overburden uh, also different companies when it comes to this. But I mean, we all know that that money laundering and terrorist financing is a serious problem. We also know that, as you mentioned before, there are different activities that are most likely um, that um, money laundering happens there. Uh, there's different reports that we know from before, uh, from where, when before Web3 existed. But I was also I would also point out to some of the analysis reports that are very nicely uh, written and they really do share much more information to the public. At the same time, um, I would also maybe share this information with everyone that is listening if they are uh, working at a project or they are basically founders or they only hold crypto assets that um, tools like chainalysis solidum labs trm labs etc are developing those are becoming also obligatory from a crypto asset service perspective uh, from within the regulations that are now written or guidances. So the European Banking Authority, for example, wrote a guidance where they included the need for using this kind of uh, tools and software uh, for the crypto asset service providers in order to follow all uh, illicit and potentially problematic activities. Fascinating. Uh, I'm saying that a lot, but I'm learning a lot. Thank you so much. And um, one last question, if you please, if you have time. Um, you talked about service providers a lot. Could you clarify what this encompasses? Uh, encompasses, for example, is a SaaS, uh, you know, software as a service company uh, operating in the middle in the um, in the sector of cryptocurrencies concerned? Um, does, does it? have to be to feel concerned about uh, these new regulations or is it just coin providers like ex exchanges people issuing coins or people opening their new blockchain or is it also uh, something that basically uh, involves everyone uh, in the sector who uh, would be even remotely related to the sector what do you think um, uh, could you clarify that of course, this is a brilliant question as well. Uh, basically, the crypto asset service providers are operators, are companies that are offering services within the European Union and that are a part of the list that the European Commission initially drafted in MICA. So they are not crypto asset uh, issuers. So those are not service providers. Mm -hmm. If I, they only uh, issue uh, the tokens uh, or crypto assets, they're not any kind of uh, 
private entities or person that holds the assets. Those are organizations that offer services that are related to crypto assets. And we have a list. Most of them, for example, are exchanges. So those are the ones we know. Uh, then custodials and similar organizations. And for those, they are specific rules and they will need to uh, get a Mika license in the future. So I think that um, this is really and mostly done and regulated from a consumer protection point of view. Okay, just last funny stuff, last word. Uh, do you have an idea off the top of your head um, about how much it would cost? So I, I understand it will take several months to get that license, but how much would it cost to get that Mika license in, the, in Europe? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I do not have um, an estimation. Okay. The thing is that it requires so many different things. For example, the license and also the governance of the organization, uh, the marketing uh, alignment when it comes to, for example, not the license, but when it comes to token issuance. So um, it is very important because it is it does require a lot of, um, I would say, systematization and organization within the governance system that this organization has. It does maybe require new hires. It does require that the management is, uh, you know, uh, basically has the knowledge and has the experience that can lead this organization. So it goes beyond merely getting this paper and talking to the lawyers and going through the process, but it might require also some uh, restructuring within the organization that can okay. add additional costs as well. Okay, so it can range from uh, from one end to the other end of the bracket because mm -hmm. it's uh, it can be very different from. Okay, um, thank you so much. I'll try to to find that information for a future podcast. Any last word? Um, I would just like to thank you for this invitation, and I'm also uh, very much inviting everyone to follow us on Twitter, um, the European Crypto Initiative, where we share a lot of information. And if anyone else is interested in the new developments and latest developments, that would be something that I would like to share now. Thank you so much, Marina. Thank you, everyone, for listening. This was Marina Markezic from the European Crypto Initiative. Please look them up on Twitter, LinkedIn and all the other platforms and learn many things about how things are evolving in the European Union. And if you are in the European Union, yes, you have to basically inform yourself. Also follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn and all the other platforms. Bye, everyone. And bye, Marina. Goodbye. Thank you.